And, you know, originally he was going to be on the, the musicians panel, but then we had this open slot, and I, I knew Raul wanted to perform, and I, I said, you know, let's, let's do both of these things. So, Michael, take it away. Thank you, Larry. So, I just met Raul backstage, and we had a very good conversation. And we said everything we had to say, so we're, we're not going to say anything. We're just going to sit here. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll talk. So uh, we talked about a lot of things, about music and, and your, your history and your background. Uh, and you are basically someone who has not put yourself into a silo. You know, we talk about silos these days where people say, I'm a musician, I play this kind of music, and I need that so, so people know who I am so they know to buy my music. But your music is, doesn't fit into any of those silos. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, for better or for worse, I have not put myself inside a box. I just make music and use the elements that I love in the music. It could be, you know, some Brazilian element. It could be some R&B element. It could be a jazz thing. And I just put it in there because I love that particular aspect of the music. And how long have you been uh, making records now, recordings? Oh, well, recordings uh, for, for a long time. Uh, records, I came back to it recently, but uh, recordings, 25 years, something like that, I don't know. And you expressed a lot of skepticism backstage about, <laughs> about vinyl, didn't you? I did. Well, so, you know, obviously, when CDs first came out, it was like, wow. You know, and all of the sort of hoopla about they were indestructible and they're small and they're portable and this and that. And we were talking about backstage. I think what happened was that on a on a low on a budget, a CD was was better because you know it was portable, you know, and probably a lot of people had fairly mediocre turntables, so the CD was better. Um, and I think it convenience sort of won out in a sense. Uh, it also allowed the record companies to resell you the same music that you already bought for more money and uh, not have to do anything. Now don't leave out the extra 20 songs that they put on the CD that the band didn't want to be released because it sounded terrible and was bad music, but they put it out anyway so they could charge you more money for the CD. Don't forget that part. Right. Okay, but then, but then you were saying you have also become a recording engineer. Yeah, so uh, the past um, six or seven records, I have learned how to, how to be a recording engineer. As a blind person, there, are, uh, there is technology out there now. Uh, there's a pro programs called screen readers, and there are people who have worked to script digital audio workstations in order to make them accessible for someone who doesn't see. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's possible. And uh, so I have really started to delve into audio, you know, what can you really hear the difference between 44.1 and 88.2 or 96? Um, can you, you know, hear the difference between an MP3 and and a, and, a, and a wave file, you know. And can you? I think I can. We Thank were talking God. about this, but I, I, I still, you know, am very in, into the scientific method, and I've never done a blind test. Sorry about the pun there. Um, as to whether I really could or not. So I've done the experiment of, of putting on a higher sampling rate same file, try to keep the same volume. I think it feels different in, 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 in your body. What resolution do you record at? I personally record at 88.2 now, for the most part. Because that translates down to a CD better than a higher resolution Much file. better, especially with the highs. And, you know, some would argue 96 even, but the, the highs are, are just a little bit less distorted. And you said an interesting thing to me backstage that when you heard the test pressing of your record, cut from a digital file, and I'm very familiar with, with that process, you heard what? I was blown away, I have to say. And this is, I have not, at, up until then, I had not owned a record for years. You know, we moved and we moved out of New York and I didn't move any of my records or turntable. It's all in New Mexico where I'm from still. 
And I made a, a record of guitar duets, mostly acoustic guitar, some, some electric guitar, with, uh, with some of the great guitar players, Mike Stern and Leonel Luecke and... Um, Were they live with you or did they... they no, they we did it all during the pandemic. Uh. We did it all. But we did, we decided to do a vinyl and when I heard the vinyl, I, I got to say, there was something about it. And I, I've listened to the record a thousand times on my pretty good studio monitors and digital at 88.2 sampling and everything else. And there was something about the vinyl. Of course, we had to buy a good turntable in order to hear that. So... Well, like I said to you backstage, I, I look at it when you take a digital file and make a record out of it. It's kind of like an additional plug-in. It's some extra thing sauce that gets added, and whatever it is, it makes it sound more pleasing to the ear. And what, what is it all about but making a recording that's pleasing to the ear to listen to, right? That's what it's all about. Yeah, I mean, I... Philosophically, as I say, I'm, you know, still slightly on the fence about the audio quality, but I have heard something. But, but the other thing is records somehow are causing people to renew their idea of the value of music. There's something about the music being so convenient as a stream or as that it loses value. It loses, you know, you don't invest anything in it. You don't see an, a record cover or whatever, and then you, you kind of, it doesn't have the, whereas records, as I was saying to Michael, we used to have social events where we got together, put a record on, and listened to the album from start to finish. Not put it on and party in the background. I mean, listen to an album. And I think that perhaps the renewal of vinyl is, is, is helping with that. And we need everything we can to help the consumer see value in what we do as creators, for sure. Why don't you talk for a minute about the micro your, microphone of, your vocal microphone of choice? I am a absolute believer in the Neumann U67 as a vocal mic. And um, I use them when I did recordings in studios in New York, and um, they weren't making them anymore, as many of you know. Um, and, you know, they were 15, 20, 25 grand on eBay. <laughs> and uh, so they came up with the new ones. And I had some engineer friends of mine testing. They said, Raul, this is the real deal. This isn't some cheap remake of a U67. So I sprang for it. And it is magic. And, it's, and the magic of, about it is really pretty simple. Some mics have a proximity effect, right? That the closer you get, it changes. This one doesn't really have that. It sort of has, it's this. But some mics, the closer you get, the, di the, mo the diff more different it sounds. It gets warmer. And some mics have no proximity effect at all. The one I'm thinking of is the RE20 has absolutely no proximity. You can scream into it, you can talk far away from it. The EQ is the same, or pretty close to the and same. And your, your microphone of choice has This a one is completely, if you sing into it very close to the mic with a windscreen, you get a sweet um, a band of frequencies that is really hard to get on an EQ. And it's got a tube in it, right? And the it's tube has tube, more yeah. distortion, more distortion, but it's a pleasing distortion. I don't know what they do, but the tube never gets warm. I don't understand that. But All right. I think, I think it's time for you to uh, perform, and there's no uh, Neumann microphone for you, but I think it's... Actually, this is a Neumann that I'm using, but it's not a U67, obviously. <laughs> All right. Well, th thanks. It was great talking with you. <laughs> yep.
lying awake Waiting for one good day to break Secretly ill Dreaming of spaces left to fill Come with me There may not be a next time That's from my uh, latest album, Lost and Found, which is in vinyl, of course. And uh, it's uh, being distributed by Selecto Hits, of course, and also uh, Copycat Media. Thanks a lot for a great sounding record. Uh, Used to sit and worry about the future Worrying about the future don't change the past Used to think tomorrow would be better But now I know that I'm doing the best that I can I'm just a man Trying to find the reasons why I stand Took some time to realize that I am what I am And I want to be rich, I want to be happy Inside, the love that shines bright enough to last a lifetime. I wanna be rich more than a fantasy. Ride the winds and climb, cause it's all a state of mind. Wake up in the morning. 
morning and I turn the pages Don't understand what's going down Everybody's acting so outrageous It's gonna take a lot of love to turn things around And I'm just a man Trying to find the reasons why I stand Took some time to realize that I am what I am And I wanna be rich, I wanna be happy And live inside a love that shines bright enough to last a lifetime I wanna be rich, more than a fantasy Ride the winds and climb Cause it's all a state of Talking about going to heaven, grab a little bit of heaven right here on earth. Trouble times lead to healing times. I'm upset and I'm feeling fine. It's just taking and they give that makes this life worth living. Makes this life worth living. I wanna be rich, I wanna be happy, and live inside a love that shines bright enough to last a lifetime. I wanna be rich, more than a fantasy. Ride the winds and climb. Ride the winds and climb Ride the winds and climb Because it's all a state of mind Thanks a lot. You didn't uh, tell us you were bringing a brass section with you. <laughs> that was wonderful. So how was it performing at a at a making vinyl event? Was it was it good? Yeah, well, people listened. That's good. Yeah, they did. Usually they sit here and talk, but I was watching; they were actually <laughs> listening, which is really good. Yeah, I, you know, as I said, I think the I think the the renew the revivification of vinyl is definitely helping to bring back the perception of value. It's it's sort of a soapbox of mine you know I really it's unfortunate you know with all the convenience and everything that's happened it's it's a it's an absolute gold mine for the music consumer which we all are right you can get on the computer and find almost anything and everything you want but for creators it's a bit of a disaster you know because um, it's difficult to convince some people to buy music when they can get it for free so, how many records have you put out on vinyl? Only two. And you've recorded 14 altogether? Correct. See, I did my homework, so that's good. Correct, yeah, but... but um, and how different has the experience been? Well, as I said, um, I think that the one that really blew me away was, you know, the, the guitar record, because it's all acoustic instruments. Um, you know, as 
you know, like in some ways, if you use a lot of programming, a lot of synthesizers, you know, some of these things are 16-bit sampled anyway. So, but when you're playing an acoustic instrument, that's when I really heard it when I was, you know, listening to the test pressings of the vinyl. Um, also, I, I, it's been a long time since I've heard a record with absolutely no noise whatsoever. <laughs> Which, of course, happens when you have a new record. But well, if you take care of it, it will be that way for a long, long time, decade after decade. Yeah, that's amazing. Because, <laughs> you know, I grew up with... <laughs> well, great. Any, any final last thoughts? Yeah, I... Um, Thank you for having me here. Uh, it's an honor, and uh, thank you for the work you're doing. And I'd like to thank Copycat Media once again. They did my record, and there's okay. more, more coming. So I'm going to probably do vinyl and everything I do from now on. And I may even do vinyl on some... Th yeah. I, I may even do some vinyl on some past things. Uh, that that's one of the other reasons I started a label, my own label. What's it called? It's called Recondite Records. Because uh, when you own the masters, you don't have to ask for permission to do vinyl. Actually, my last two records before I did my own records, I could not get my label to do vinyl. We asked them to, and they wouldn't do it. So. And who cut these records for you? Who did the mastering? You... Um, the mastering was done by Arf Allen Silverman in New York, oh, who's great, great. somebody probably knows here. Yeah. I know him. He's, he's, he's great. Yeah, he's wonderful. Yeah. All right, well, thanks for coming, and it was great to meet you, and, uh, and everybody, I'm sure, enjoyed the performance. So thank you, Ram Midong. Thanks. Thanks.